next on Columbus Neighborhoods, the history and impact of Mount Olivet Baptist Church. Then we explore the architectural splendor of Christ the King Church. Then meet two women in the LGBTQ community and their challenges in the Methodist Church. And we celebrate life with the Bhutanese community. It's a show about faith, next on Columbus Neighborhoods. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. Through the ages, spaces for worship have been sanctuaries for the human condition, just like our location today at First Unitarian Universalist Church. You'll hear messages here about freedom, reason, tolerance, and love. And like everything else we've seen in this series, worship spaces have also changed throughout history. Our first story is about Mount Olivet Baptist Church, a traditionally African-American Baptist church that started in 1907. Back then, churches served so many needs in the African-American community. They were social hubs, as well as support in times of need and the spiritual anchor for so many families. Let's see what's changed and what's stayed the same. a group of 13 people who were a part of the Shiloh Baptist Church of our community decided that a church needed to be in this particular section of town. There was no significant Baptist church presence in the south end of Columbus around 1907. It was the feeling of the folks at Shiloh that they should start a mission. They named that mission Mount Olivet. The church has continued to exist continuously since that time and has done extremely well. In the early days, most African Americans couldn't be a part of social groups and stuff, so they formed their own social groups within the church. And from that it grew and they had a bond. It was just a whole different environment being a part of the church. We had uh, several choirs. We uh, worshiped on Wednesday night at what we call prayer meeting. We had a basketball team here at Mount Olivet. We had a softball team. We had a bowling team. So anything that you wanted to do, you could come and do it. Not only did we have these teams, we played against other people in the city. So it was an opportunity to get out, to see stuff that you had never seen before. And those groups had a variety of fundraising efforts that they did individually and collectively. People enjoyed coming and frying fish and selling dinners and stuff like that because that's what they did. They did it in the kitchens where they worked at and so they were able to come to church and do the same thing with a sense of pride and they took pride in what they did. At that time, banks in the city would not grant African American people money. There was a need then to establish our own financial institution. And out of that need, the Mount Olivet Federal Credit Union was born. It was about trying to make sure that we could help each other. It took some of the uh, 
weight away from the church of having to, quote, give things when we could try to make people credit worthy and establish their own ability to borrow money and pay it back appropriately. I think that, that the, the people of Mount Olive felt that it was, uh, it was a privilege and an honor to realize that we had our own credit union and we'd much rather do it here than do it on High Street. Now, so many people can borrow money from other institutions. You have banks, uh, credit unions on the job and the like. So after uh, 51 years, we had to uh, forego the credit union. That was not an easy decision to make, but it was a decision that we had to make. We were committed to helping each other. I think that was a big, big part of why our church was successful because it was important for us not to let anybody go under, so to speak. When I came to Mount Olivet, I came with the vision of a strong urban ministry. The ties that binded us were originated with a neighborhood of emphasis. And most of the people who went to the church lived within a one mile radius of the church. Now we have people who come to worship and who fellowship with us from all sections of Columbus. People still come because of the fellowship. They have a bond. They feel like, the, you know, they don't want to go anyplace else. And by any means necessary, they'll get here. We have a commitment to the inner city. And the historical significance of being downtown is something that I don't want to see us lose. And it's been beneficial. Even though we uh, originated as a neighborhood church, times do change, but our spirit, our core, doesn't change. We just have to keep talking about the church and we have to keep instilling it, generation after generation. When I look at where Mount Olivet has come from, those 13 members, and every pastor has stood on the shoulders of the pastor before them, I think the future holds bigger and better and greater things. Next, we visit Christ the King Church to find out how architecture and service influence each other. Then meet two women in the LGBTQ community and their challenges in the Methodist Church. And a look at a Hindu service in the Bhutanese community. I know a lot of people take vacations to Italy just to visit their churches and take in their inspirational architecture. But we don't have to travel that far because Jeff Darby is on the road to show us the grandeur of Christ the King Catholic Church. I've always found it interesting how early uh, you'd find churches and communities. They tended to be among the first buildings built because faith was important to people. My wife Nancy is with me and, and uh, we've been through a lot of churches in Columbus as well as elsewhere. So we're headed to Christ the King uh, Catholic Church right here on East Livingston. This is the parish where I grew up and I didn't fully appreciate how innovative and architecturally significant this church is when it opened 50 years ago in 1967. Now, because I work in preservation and understand architecture, I'm really excited about going in and talking about it in the context of what was going on in the Catholic Church at the time and how this church specifically reflects that mid-1960s period. Boy, so this is completely different from the traditional Catholic Church. It's, it is. It's unlike it is. anything I've seen. It isn't the, uh, in the form of a cross and really the shape from the outside, this is Christ the King Church. So the form is in the shape of a crown. So you started coming here after it was built in 1968. I was baptized in this parish, so I actually attended the church before this was built. But imagine coming in 1968 into this church that doesn't look anything like any Catholic church I had ever been in before, and really any Catholic church that I've been in the past 50 years. Well, what drove those changes is so different from what was traditional. 
What is so typical is architecture is the product of its time. And this church was built in that immediate period right after the completion of the Second Vatican Council, mm -hmm. which really brought about a lot of changes in the liturgy and how the mass was celebrated. It in included greater participation by the laity. Mm -hmm. The biggest change was the priests faced the congregation and embraced it. Everything about this church was designed down to the smallest detail. And stained glass windows are typical of churches in most, most denominations, yes. certainly the Catholic churches, but these are not your traditional stained glass windows either. They're they are so not. distinctively different. And they surround you. They, they really uh, do. They really the accentuate color the and shape texture. of the church. Hello, Father. Hello, Hello, Father. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Christ the King. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. It's good to see you. Thank you. Can you tell us more about these stained glass windows? They're so unusual. You just, yes. don't, you just don't see them. Absolutely. I love showing off Christ the King, especially the stained glass windows. Actually, my favorite part of the church and the stained glass windows depict the creed. So just a, a quick summary of our faith in this beautiful luminous glass. Even in historic churches, Gothic cathedrals, mm -hmm. the stained glass windows were how people learned oh, their, their faith because they didn't read. So stained mm -hmm. glass and windows have always been used in that way to really reinforce that whole idea of religion, liturgy, mm -hmm. faith, beliefs. Very interesting. Yeah, they're not just pictures. No, not just pictures, not just pictures. And there's there's more to the church than the stained glass. Can I show you sure. some more, We'd some of my it. favorite yeah. features of, of the church? Over here we have um, another image of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And what's so unique about this image is that she's carrying the Christ child. And the Christ child, if you look closely, is actually grasping Mary's hair. Just to show the tenderness of the moment and his love for, yes. for Mary. It's interesting, instead of those very stilted uh, depictions of almost mm -hmm. no animation in it, this has a lot of animation it in shows terms of the relationship. The relationship, her humanity, his humanity, yes. and the, the bond of love that they share. Okay, so um, if I may, just wanna show you a few other things, the church that great. I particularly like. So we're talking about devotion to Our Lady. Yes. Well, Back in about 2001, Christ the King opened its doors to a Spanish-speaking community in the neighborhood, and that community continued to grow and grow and grow. And now, at Christ the King, we have about 1,000 Spanish speakers who come to Mass here every single weekend. The parish is actually majority. It's about 60% Spanish-speaking. So we wanted to install a image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. She is the icon oh. of Hispanic Catholicism. This chapel here with Our Lady is used every single day. People come in, they pray their rosary, say their prayers, and it's a way for them to connect not only to Our Lady, not only to Christ, not only to their faith, but also to, to their culture, to, yes. to who they are. So they feel at home. Yeah, can I show you one more thing sure. here? Absolutely. I'm gonna yes. just lead you out here to this, this back altar here at Christ the King. Now this is where we have daily mass. So it's a place to, can I say, draw close to God, um, yet still experience the, the magnificence, the brilliance of this big space. This is where from an architectural standpoint, the architect of this building didn't have any precedent for this. And I was mm -hmm. always amazed at how you could be in this intimate, beautiful little space, but you're still part of the larger experience of being in the church. And what do you think? I always thought that looked like a cloud. I have no idea well, what that, the that, design that, intention that, was. That but. was explained to me. And if you actually look from, from the front, it, it looks like this risen Christ is ascending yes. to heaven it, you can see 40 days after his resurrection on the clouds. And the architect, he nailed it. He, he did capture the intimacy and the grandeur all at the same time. Well, thank you so much for explaining so much I in a short period of time. I appreciate you so much. Okay. <laughs> yeah, blessings. It was fun. Yeah. Next, two women, two stories from the LGBTQ community. Then, a colorful Hindu service for the whole family. This is a story about two women one who was a Methodist minister, and one who is currently studying to become one. But under current church law, neither one of them can openly serve their church. That's because both belong to the LGBTQ community, traditionally a community that is barred from full ordination in the Methodist church and many other denominations. So will that restriction stand? 
Well, the laws are currently being reviewed. Meanwhile, many rely on their faith to carry on. I wanted to become a minister because it was a calling. I answered my call and that was like 83, 84, I was in seminary. Spent those four years in seminary getting a, a dual major, getting two masters, one in liturgical arts because I'm a singer, and the other in uh, divinity so that I could combine the two. I went to um, Steubenville, Ohio, and it was about the same kind of congregation, uh, um, African-American, most uneducated, um, elderly, down in Steubenville. There are hills and little towns. And there I met um, a woman that I fell in love with. When the people of the church found out, someone went to the bishop, called him, and went to the bishop and told him. I was hurt. I was hurt. I was afraid. I became deeply depressed and sat in the parsonage um, and cried and cried and cried. I had been going to a non-denominational, um, very theologically and socially conservative church. I grew up in the church believing that it was okay to hate somebody because of who they were. That's what I was taught. Um, it was okay to be racist. It was okay to hate on poor people. And as I got older and realized I'm one of those people that they're hating, People were condemning me and hating me without knowing it. They were hurting me without knowing it, and they didn't care. That was probably the hardest part. They had no regard for what they were doing to other people. And I ended up being completely rejected by my mom's side of the family because of my identity. And that was supposedly done because that's what God would have wanted. There's, I think there's a certain amount of strength for people who identify as a member of the LGBTQ community to come back into something that has hurt them so deeply. And it got to the point where I knew that I just couldn't push it down anymore. And most people say that's, that's when you know you're really called, is when you try to push it away and it just keeps coming back. Like, your soul will not let you think of anything else. <laughs> and it gets a little annoying at sometimes because, no, I don't want to do this. This is supposed to be my choice. But it's not. And I think there's a certain peace that comes to finally accepting that. Uh, in the United Methodist Church, the elder um, when the elders are, are ordained, they are given a uh, stole around their neck. So I would like to um, let her know that there was one before, and now it's going to be her turn. We have so many things in common in, in terms of uh, a call to ministry and both being lesbian and out, but we have very different experiences. And I think she's helped me just by being herself 
to really understand and, and, and to really drive home what it means to love somebody unconditionally. Angie, it ain't gonna be easy. <laughs> it's not going to be easy. I think you are aware of that. Always stay close to God. No matter what anybody say, always stay close to God. And it's not always about what's going on in your head, but what is going on in your heart. Take it and God bless you. <laughs> I still have the roadblocks for the actual ordination process, but those are human made constructs. It doesn't change a call to ministry. And I may just be a footnote in somebody's story somewhere along the way, but it's there. there. Every person who tries, every person who answers that call and says, we are here too, um, it helps us understand what the kingdom is really supposed to look like. We've shown you a lot of Christian-based stories so far, but we all know that we are a multicultural city with many beliefs. This next story is about the Bhutanese immigrants here in Columbus and how their faith is colorful and inclusive. We are all from Bhutan. We live in refugee camp around 17 years in Nepal. The, some of the European countries, and uh, including the United States, they decide to pick up the people from there and do the resettlement. When I come to Columbus, it feel me like uh, oh, I'm living like my country. I saw a lot of like a cornfield, a lot of agriculture field, cow are grazing, my family, my dad, my mom, my brother, they like it. Okay, we decide to stay in the Columbus. But the thing is that we are lacking of the language. That is the main problem. See, our parents, our seniors, they cannot go outside without the support of the anybody. We organize some type of religious activities, so which will give some comfortable to our elder people. Our temple, we have programs going on every Sunday. We do prayers. We exchange our views. What should be our spiritual upbringing? Every year we have a program like a three days Sirmat Bhagat Katha. That Katha gives to the people how to track in the peaceful life, how we love each other, how we respect to the people, why we born in the earth, and what we need to be do for the keeping peace and a big quiet in the family, good in the neighborhood, and how we get a relation with the all kind of people of the world. We are evolving, so that will be very welcoming for anybody to come here and share their views. And the only thing, you got to take off your shoes before going into the temple, that's it. Whatever faith you have, whatever society you come from, whatever background you have, we don't mind at all, so long as you are a peace-loving person, you want to share your views, we are very receptive to it.
thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WLSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by. At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Wartime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. <laughs>